My name's Will, and this is Will to Read. Uh, today, I'm going to be doing a review of The Great Explosion by Eric Frank Russell. Um, I did not know anything about this book prior to picking it up. I had never heard of Eric Frank Russell before. Um, yeah, I basically just, when I grabbed it, uh, I thought it sounded like it might be a fun, quick uh, space adventure that might, might have something to say about colonialism, uh, if I was lucky. But um, what I got was uh, a lot more in the best way possible. So let's get to the summary. Mission of Empire. Earthmen had colonized hundreds of planets in the four centuries of deep space exploration. Independent, new civilizations founded by the discontent and adventurous of Terra. Trouble was, they were too independent, and the Terran government had ambitions for a space empire. A giant battle cruiser went out into the star lanes with instructions to persuade the colonial planets to join the empire, and with a couple of thousand troops to back up the persuasion. It looked like an interesting, if easy, mission. After all, what kind of opposition could a bunch of backwards planets offer to the most advanced military power in the galaxy? Quite a lot, as it turned out. And all of it wildly unexpected. One of the old pros of science fiction, Eric Frank Russell, has, in The Great Explosion, written a fast-paced and compelling adventure, a fascinating look at a possible tomorrow. So the back doesn't really cover much of the story, most of that happens either in the prologue or really early in chapter one. Basically, in this book, we follow a diplomatic mission to four different planets with the intent of establishing military bases and embassies. While there, we learn about how these planets developed over the course of their 400 years of isolation from Terra and see how the Terrans react to it. I would go into more specifics, but that might get spoilery, so instead I'm going to expand on that in threads. So. If you don't want this 60-year-old book spoiled for you, here's your cue to skip to end thoughts. Let's get into it. There are two major themes in this book I want to discuss, colonialism and freedom. Russell shows contact between the colonized and the colonizer in a relatively consistent pattern. The Terrans learn about the planet and opine about how immoral or crazy the inhabitants must be, then, once they meet one of the inhabitants, the inhabitant retorts with how backwards Terrans are, and things proceed from there. It's particularly interesting to see the perspective of a potentially colonized people, because in regard to the historical record, those perspectives rarely survive. One of the ones that did survive, and the one this book kept bringing to mind for me, is Al Jabari's record of Napoleon's invasion of Egypt. Here's his discussion of the French entering a man's home. The French entered it, stepping on the carpets with their shoes and sandals, as was their custom, since they never take off their shoes, with which they tread upon filth, not even when they sleep. Among their repulsive habits also is the practice of spitting and blowing their noses upon the furnishings. Their etiquette, however, is such that whenever one of them blows his nose or spits, he rubs it in with his shoes, and so on. Let's compare that with how Russell has the Hygeans, a group of nudists very particular about physical beauty, react to seeing the Terrans. Just a warning, there is fat shaming in this excerpt. So if you don't want to hear that, go to this timestamp. Studying his audience with unconcealed disdain, one gave fraternal greeting by saying, Terrans, as dirty-minded as ever. The ambassador was taking a second look when this observation hit him over the head. He bristled at once. What do you mean? Hiding yourselves from the glorious sunshine and the face of creation, informed the other. Letting his gaze linger significantly upon the ambassadorial belly, he remarked to his companion, I suppose it could be conceded that this one has good reason to be ashamed of his body, eh, Pincuff? Yaz agreed, Pincuff. Years of greed and neglect have taken their toll. I resent that, said the ambassador. He resents it, Boogle, said Pincuff. Then he let go a loud and vulgar laugh. His roving eyes took in the ship, found its ports full of astonished faces. Look at that lot, Boogle. Afraid to come out and show themselves, pale and weedy to a man, Yaz, Boogle confirmed. 
God bless their shriveled little chests. I'm emphasizing how those the Terrans intend to control view the Terrans over how the Terrans view them, because the Terrans are pretty clearly meant to be stand-ins for a historic colonial power, in particularly the United States, though I could see an argument for any European colonial power as well, though I think the argument for the U.S. is made strong by the fact that one of the reasons the Terrans give for wanting to establish bases on the pl these planets is the potential for an invasion from an as-yet-undiscovered alien race. These kinds of vague potential threats are similar to the ones the U.S. uses as excuses for maintaining its military bases abroad, so that's why I'm going to go with the U.S. Although I also see shades of France in here, but I also recently did a paper on the French in Algeria a few semesters ago, and I've lived my whole life in the U.S., so that might have influenced my interpretation, and Russell is English. But anyway. Because the Terrans are meant to represent the point of view of places, at least in the U.S., we've been taught are the exemplars of civilization, it's refreshing to see a rebuke of that flawed premise, and instead a demonstration of the more complex truth. What one society deems civilized, another will view as barbaric, and that what we view as civilized largely depends on the context in which we are raised and the people who we surround ourselves with. The other major theme Russell explores in this book is freedom, more specifically, what constitutes a free society. We can see a slow buildup in the first three planets. The first is a former penal colony, and thus the people organize themselves into kind of mafia families, for lack of a better allegory. The freedom of this society is literally freedom from servitude. They are no longer imprisoned. It's as bare bones as you can get. The second planet was settled by the Hygeans. In addition to the freedom from clothing already mentioned, the Hygeans also emphasize a more classical view of attaining the human ideal, dating back to ancient Greece, which proposed it involved developing the mind as well as the body. This process leads one to a kind of freedom due to your increased ability to do things. The third planet is found to be deserted. It's assumed by the Terrans that all those that settled there had been wiped out. However, it's mentioned that it was settled by a group which sought to combine the teachings of Islam and Buddhism. Now, I'm not particularly familiar with the teachings of Islam, but I am very familiar with those of Buddhism as a slightly lax practitioner. One of the goals of Buddhist practitioners is to end the cycle of rebirth and thus suffering by reaching nirvana. It could be easily interpreted that the people who settled on this planet weren't wiped out by a disease, as the characters conjecture, but instead that they ended their cycle of rebirth, and thus are free of suffering. The last planet is, I believe, Russell's version of a utopia, because all of the other planets had problems, but this one doesn't really. The people here call themselves Gans, which they took from their inspiration, Gandhi. So, this is a society heavily based in the idea of nonviolent civil disobedience. This is best exemplified by their motto, F-I-W, or freedom, I won't, which is also used as a tactic against aggression, as Gleed, one of the Terrans, figures. For instance, Gleed continued, suppose that when I go back to the ship that snorting rhinoceros Bidworthy gives me an order, and I give him the frozen eye and say, I won't, what happens? It follows as an inviolable law of nature that he either drops dead or throws me in the clink. That would do you a lot of good. Wait a bit, I haven't finished yet. I'm in the pokey, demoted and a disgrace to the service, but the job still needs doing. So Bidworthy picks on somebody else. The victim, being a soulmate of mine, also donates the icy optic and says, I won't. Into the jug he goes, and I've got company. Bidworthy tries again and again and again, and again. There are more of us crammed in the brig. It will only hold 20. So they take over the engineer's mess. Leave our mess out of this, requested Harrison. They take over the mess, insisted Gleed, thoroughly determined to penalize the engineers. Pretty soon it's filled to the roof with I Woners. Bidworthy is still raking them in as fast as he can go if by then he hasn't burst a dozen blood vessels. So they take over the bleeder dormitories. Why keep picking on my crowd? And pile them ceiling high with bodies, Gleed said, deriving sadistic pleasure from the picture. 
until in the end Bidworthy has to get buckets and brushes and go down on his knees and do his own deck scrubbing while Greater, Shelton, and the rest take turn for guard duty. By that time, his loftiness, the ambassador, is in the galley busily cooking for the prisoners and is being assisted by a discontented bunch of yesing pen pushers. This is very similar to a tactic the mathematician, philosopher, and dedicated pacifist Bertrand Russell proposes in his 1916 book, Justice in Our Time, saying that if Britain were invaded by Germany, they could just not comply with the Germans' demands and not recognize their authority. Whatever edicts they might issue would be quietly ignored by the population. If they ordered that German should be the language taught in schools, the schoolmasters would go on as if no such order had been issued. If the schoolmasters were dismissed, the parents would no longer send the children to the school. If they ordered that English young men should undergo military service, the young men would simply refuse. After shooting a few, the Germans would have to give up the attempt in despair. If they tried to raise revenue by customs duties at the ports, they would have to have German customs officers. This would lead to a strike of all the dock laborers, so that the way to raise revenue would become impossible. If they tried to take over the railways, there would be a strike of the railway servants. Whatever they touched would instantly become paralyzed and it would soon be evident, even to them, that nothing was to be made out of England unless the population could be conciliated. However, you can't create a society based purely off of not obeying authority. There has to be more of a structure. For this, we can see a lot of inspiration from the political writings of a man most people in Booktube will know for his very famous novels, Anna Karenina and War and Peace, Leo Tolstoy. The reason why I'm citing Tolstoy particularly is that I know his writings on pacifism were influential on Gandhi, and thus are likely to have influenced Eric Frank Russell's conception of the Gan society. For example, let's take a look at a conversation between Gleed and Alyssa, one of the Gans. A man has duties. He has no right to refuse those. No? She raised tantalizing eyebrows, delicately curved. Who defines these duties? Himself or somebody else? His superiors, most times. Superiors, she scoffed with devastating scorn. No man is superior to another. No man has the slightest right to define another man's duties. If anyone on Terra exercises such impudent power, it is only because idiots permit him to do so. They fear freedom. They prefer to be told. They like to be ordered around. They love their chains and kiss their manacles. What men? Now let's compare that to a line from Tolstoy's treatise on pacifistic Christian anarchism, The Kingdom of God is Within You. The man who is controlled by moral influence acts in accordance with his own desires. Authority, in the sense in which the word is ordinarily understood, is a means of forcing a man to act in opposition to his desires. The man who submits to authority does not do as he chooses, but as he is obliged by authority. The Gans also lack a formal government and refuse to recognize the Terran one, or to allow for the placing of an ambassador. This rings of another thing Tolstoy addresses. Men who have once outgrown the governmental form of society cannot go back to it again and all the reasoning in the world cannot make the man who has outgrown the governmental form of society take part in actions disallowed by his conscience, any more than the fully grown bird can be made to return into the eggshell. The Gans also can do pretty much as they please, as long as they don't interfere in others' rights. There is no form of money or property ownership. As long as you are using the land, it's yours. And once you stop using it, it stops being yours. In place of money, they instead exchange obs, or obligations, which keeps people connected to one another and the community from falling apart. In the end, many Terrans desert the ship, including two main characters, Harrison and Gleed, to live among the Gans. On the other two planets, the ship lands on either no Terran is left there, in the case of the first planet, or they are forced to stay there, in the case of the second. In the case of this planet, all of those that stay behind are either low-ranking soldiers or engineers, 
and they do so of their own volition and at risk of facing punishment. Those with governmental authority leave in frustration and defeat, having made no real progress on the planet. From this, we can conclude that Russell sees this final planet and thus Gandhian-style pacifism as a way to achieve a more perfect society and a more perfect form of freedom. Wow, that last section was long. Okay, I'll try to be quick here. Uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but this book is very funny. I found a lot of the humor aged really well and found myself chuckling on quite a few occasions. There's also a lot of 50 slang, which I found very fun. This is one of the best plotted books I've read in a while. If you couldn't tell from the summary, it's basically a series of vignettes, but the vignettes build on each other thematically so that the final one feels like not just the end of another story, but a conclusion to how we're supposed to view the previous ones. There are a few moments that have aged poorly, such as the fat shaming mentioned earlier, and the R word is used once, though I I think it might have been the medical term at the time. But anyway, overall, though, I think this has aged pretty well. I give it five stars on Goodreads. I would highly recommend it. I don't know if it's necessarily a book I think everyone will love, but it's also only 160 pages. So if you end up not liking it, you haven't wasted that much time. All right, that concludes my uh, review of Eric Frank Russell's The Great Explosion. I don't know what the next video is going to be. I'm recording this two weeks ahead of when you see this, so uh, maybe it'll be a review, maybe it'll be a tag, maybe it'll be something else. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but in the meantime, to do all the YouTube stuff. Like, subscribe, comment, give it a thumbs up, do all that fun shit. See ya.